Amongst all the different and varied controversies that Marx's writings inspire, the relationship between him and the different moral philosophers of his time is certainly one of the most salient. Scholars have attempted to link him to a wide range of moral systems, and some even have argued that Marx's thought does not admit an extension to moral philosophy. In this video, however, I will focus only on the relationship between Marx and the doctrine of utilitarianism, as presented by central figures Bentham and John Stuart Mill. And for historical accuracy, it is important to notice here that Marx's critique is mainly directed towards Benthamite utilitarianism, since Mill's main work on this matter was not published until 1861, when most of Marx's critique had already been completed. My aim is to show how there is no possible way to link Marx's standpoint on morality to that of the utilitarians, and to demonstrate how, in fact, the Marxist critique of utilitarianism alone can successfully refute the principle of utility. In my doing so, I will mainly rely on the German ideology, since it is in this text where Marx laid out this critique of morality, including that of utilitarianism. As described by Bentham, the principle of utility is that which determines the moral worth of an action, event, object or institution according to whether it tends to promote or decrease the happiness, understood here as the experience of pleasure, of the individual whose interests are in play. The utility of an action, event, object or institution is therefore correctly defined as the property which endues it with the ability to produce the desired pleasure or at least the minimum amount of pain. This principle, of course, presupposes that it is preferable to maximize happiness rather than its opposite, that being pain. However, according to Bentham, this is not problematic, since the justification of this position lies on the fundamental fact that the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain are embedded in human nature. So for Bentham, pain and pleasure are our sovereign masters, as he puts it. To compute the overall utility of the action under consideration, utilitarians proposed the cost-benefit analysis method. In a cost-benefit analysis, all the information regarding the production of pleasure or pain is gathered into the equation utility equals pleasure minus pain. Bentham also proposes a method to calculate each of these individual variables of this equation, which considers aspects such as the duration, intensity, fecundity, and so on, of each pleasure or pain. Here, I will not discuss in detail how these computations are done, since the specifics of such an action are almost irrelevant to Marx. However, what ought to be noticed is the fact that the predominant view in classical utilitarianism is that there is, in fact, a way to quantitatively measure the utility of that object, action, institution, or event whose moral worth is being evaluated, independently of its distinctive qualities. In his discussion of the principle of utility, Bentham is also required to present some notion of the individual and the community, since it is the benefit of such entities that utilitarianism seeks to maximize. To this requirement, Bentham replies, The community is a fictitious body composed of the individual persons who are considered as constituting, as it were, its members. The interest of the community, then, is what? The sum of the interests of the several members who, who compose it. Thus, for Bentham, the individual is a private entity whose interests are only linked to those of the community insofar as they are a part of the whole. According to this definition, individuals are essentially independent from their social context, what implies that they mainly relate to each other in an instrumental manner based on the utility that they supposedly gain in each interaction. From this follows that, by following his own self-interest, which is one of the parts, the individual is at the same time pursuing the general interest, which is the whole. The conclusion is then made that different institutions, the different institutions of a society where the interests of such individual are to be satisfied, must therefore conform to his private nature in order to be successful, what accounts for Bentham and Mill's numerous arguments in favor of private property, the division of labors, free market, etc.
Marx's criticism to Benthamite utilitarianism, which is arguably the maximum exponent of classical utilitarianism, consists mainly of two points, from which a subset of less relevant critiques can be extracted. The focus of his critique is mainly centered around the conservative nature of utilitarianism, which strongly contrasts with the radical and revolutionary spirit that prevails in Marx's works. He accuses Bentham and Mill, amongst others, of justifying the capitalist mode of production and distracting the people from the, from the condition of alienation in which they live. Marx directs the first of his two major critiques to the notion of the individual defended by the classical utilitarians. According to Marx, the notion of the private individual is an erroneous, egoistic, and in fact, alienated picture which is taken from the poor conditions in which men live under capitalism. In his view, utilitarianism does not simply present a flawed principle by which to determine the moral worth of an action according to its usefulness, but also assumes a determined view of individuals which it takes from the social context where it was formed. In the case of, of classical utilitarianism, the individual that it presupposes is the private individual characteristic of a capitalist society, which is an individual who is alienated from his own social nature and therefore sees all other individuals as potential threats. Thus, utilitarianism does not produce its own notion of the individual, but rather takes it from an external source. This, according to Marx, is problematic since it means that utilitarianism does not and cannot provide a proper basis for social change. A doctrine that can potentially bring about social change is that which abstracts itself from its social context and can thus produce a non-alienated notion of the individual. Such a doctrine will therefore have the necessary tools to critically analyze all forms of social relations, including those social relations of the society in which it was born. However, this aspect of utilitarianism, as Marx points out, only allows it to be critical of the social relations inherited from the feudal mode of production, what gives the utilitarian doctrine a false sense of radicalism. But it cannot, in fact, critique the relations produced by capitalist societies. Utilitarianism is thus a mere empty formalism that is only filled with content when it enters a determined stage in history. As Marx says, from the outset, the utility theory had the aspect of a theory of general utility. Yet this aspect only became fraught with meaning when economic relations, especially division of labor and exchange, were included. With division of labor, the private activity of the individual becomes generally useful. Bentham's general utility becomes reduced to the same general utility which is asserted in competition as a whole. The economic content gradually turned the utility theory into a mere apologia of the existing state of affairs, an attempt to prove that under existing conditions the mutual relations of people today are the most advantageous and generally useful. As we can see, Marx here is making the rebuttal to utilitarianism which is deeply grounded on his critique of ideology and the theory of historical materialism. He has rooted the doctrine right to its material basis, which is the division of labor, the economic relations of a capital society, and so on and so forth, and shown how it gradually became a solid component of the ideological realm of society, which Marx, uh, well, the Marxist terminology calls the superstructure. Having demonstrated the conservative nature of the utilitarian doctrine, Marx can now justifiably describe the principle of utility as an abstract principle that fails to move from the universal to the particular, that is, from moralitat, which is the abstract and moral structure of the doctrines developed by the moral philosophers of a determined society, and the actual ethical and moral principles that represent the real and material ethical life of a determined society. Marx's second critique to classical utilitarianism is directed to the concept of utility itself. For Marx, the need that utilitarians have for abstracting from all the unique characteristics of each human action and relation the single, rigid aspect of usefulness is product of the material basis of capitalist societies where there exists the need to dissolve 
all the different particularities of each commodity into the expression of money. As he says, the apparent absurdity of merging all the manifold relationships of people in the one relation of usefulness, this apparently metaphysical abstraction arises from the fact that in modern bourgeois society, all relations are subordinated in practice to the one abstract monetary commercial relation. This theory came to the fore with Hobbes and Locke at the same time as the first and second English revolutions, those first battles by which the bourgeoisie won political power. Hence, the actual relations that are presupposed here are speech, love, definite manifestations of definite qualities of individuals. Now, these relations are supposed not to have the meaning peculiar to them, but to the expression and manifestation of some third relation attributed to them, the relation of utility or utili utilization. Again, Marx has traced the origins of this peculiar fetishizing about the usefulness of human actions and relations all the way to its material origin, which is the two English revolutions of the 17th century by which the bourgeoisie secured political power. It has, he has shown how from that starting point, that being Hobbes and Locke, the theory gradually became stronger with the consolidation of the capitalist mode of production stimulated by policies of the nature of the enclosure acts and demonstrated how it reached its climax with the principle of utility. The nature of the utilitarian argument is thus purely ideological. Its purpose is that of, is that of justifying and guaranteeing the reproduction of the exploitation of man by man. As I have pointed out earlier, by the time Mill's famous utilitarianism was published, Marx had already presented almost the entirety of his critique to the principle of utility. Marx was certainly not the only one who criticized cl classical utilitarianism for being an egoistic doctrine and obliterating the richness of human actions and relations with its notion of utility. Other well-known philosophers such as Kant had already done this. However, his rebuttal certainly stands out due to the revolutionary theory of historical materialism and the ideological critique method that he used in the process. Mill was aware of criticisms concerning the egoistic and inhuman appearance of the principle of utility. He replied to them by presenting a reformed utilitarianism that no longer supported some of the most unpopular aspects of Benthamite's utilitarianism, such as the calculation a ultranza of utilities. In chapter 2 of Utilitarianism, Mill first replies to the objection that the tendency to measure pain or pleasure in a quantitative manner obliterates the distinctiveness of each individual pain or pleasure. He argues that the principle of utility can, in fact, distinguish between higher and lower pleasures. However, this discernment can only be made by those individuals who have experienced both pleasures one wishes to compare. He writes, of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is the more desirable pleasure. If one of the two is, by those who are competently acquainted with both, placed so far above the other that they prefer it, even though knowing it to be attended with a greater amount of discontent, and would not resign it for any quantity of the other pleasure which their nature is capable of, we are justified in ascribing to the preferred enjoyment a superiority in quality, so far outweighing the quantity as to render it in comparison of small account. Mill probably did not write this objection with the intention of rebutting Marx's own objection. However, were that the case, this response would still not be enough to refute Marx's ideological critique. Even though he has left behind the intention to calculate with maximum precision the pleasure produced by the action we wish to analyze and has admitted that each pleasure also has a unique qualitative aspect that places it in a higher or lower status, in the end, he still dissolves the specific qualities of every human action and relation into the single notion of utility. Marx's objection is not merely that the early utilitarians were trying to give a quantitative account for utility, but rather that they were trying to give an account of utility at all.
Thus, Marx agrees with Kant on the idea that human beings and their relations have some form of inherent moral worth which is not to be polluted by any personal and contingent ends. In his text, Mill also replies to the claim that utilitarianism is an egoistic doctrine which favors division and conflict amongst individuals. According to Mill, utilitarianism does not necessarily promote the maximization of the private individual's own good without taking into account the good of others. In fact, he argues that utilitarianism has as its, uh, at its heart the maximization of the collective good, that is, the good of all the other individuals affected by a determined action. He writes, I must again repeat that the assailants of utilitarianism seldom have the justice to acknowledge that the happiness which forms the utilitarian standard of what is right in conduct is not the agent's own happiness but that of all concerned, as between his own happiness and that of others, utilitarianism requires him to be as strictly impartial as a disinterested and benevolent spectator. In the Golden Rule of Jesus of Nazareth, we read the complete spirit of the ethics of utility. To do as you would be done by and to love your neighbor as yourself constitute the ideal perfection of utilitarian morality. It might be seen from this objection that Marx's claim that utilitarianism is essentially egoistic is wrong since a utilitarian philosopher might very happily condemn selfish behavior and promote non-instrumental relationships amongst individuals. However, Mill's argument is not sufficient to overcome the ideological critique for two main reasons. Firstly, it is important to note that Marx did not use the term egoistic only to criticize those doctrines that encourage the promotion of one's self-interest without regard to the interests of others. He extends this criticism to all moral systems which assume that individuals are fundamentally private instead of social and gregarious entities. Mill never challenged the notion of the individual inherited from his predecessors. In fact, he explicitly endorses it, and as he says, the great majority of good actions are intended not for the benefit of the world, but for that of individuals, of which the good of the world is made up. It is for this reason that Mill still defends a conservative doctrine as he is concerned only with maximizing the interest of that private individual which he assumes. Thus, Mill's conclusion, as well as Bentham's, is that in order to maximize the overall happiness in society, institutions mm, such as the division of labor, free market, private property, and so on and so forth, are necessary. Secondly, as Marx would argue, Mill's argument is a mere attempt to distract the reader from the egoistic nature of utilitarianism. By assuming that individuals are fundamentally private, Mill is implying that their interests are subjectively rather than socially defined. Thus, consequence of this division of interests, individuals often view their own well-being as distinct and even opposed to the other, to the other people's uh, well-being. This, as I have argued before, is an alienated vision of individuals and the relations amongst them, since it is inherently human to cooperate and establish close relationships with each other. To avoid this problematic, Mill simply attempts to deliver a sermon on why it is that the truly utilitarian aim is that of maximizing the happiness of all parties involved, and why cooperation and respect of each other's freedom is necessary to achieve this end. However, as Marx pointed out, moral preaching is not an effective technique for social change. It is nothing other than an excuse given by those who cannot make their moral theory align with the ethical life of their society. Moral improvement does not come from the renewal of moral thought, but rather from the transformation of the material conditions under which men live. As Marx states, morality, religion, metaphysics, all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness does no longer retain the semblance of independence. They have no history, no development, but men, developing their material production and their material intercourse, alter, along with this, their real existence, their thinking and the products of their thinking. Furthermore, Marx also strongly opposes Mill's notion of liberty and right which are also product of his individualistic methodology. For Mill, 
Liberty consists of the power that men have to pursue their own interests and do as they please, so long as they do not harm others. Again, Marx claims that Mill is assuming a false and alienated view of the individual. He defends that true liberty is that of individuals to freely associate with each other, to fully satisfy their needs as social beings, and to live in an environment where they can attain self-determination through a non-alienated life activity. Thus, he claims, the right of man to freedom is not based on the association of man with man, but rather on the separation of man from man. It is the right of this separation, the right of the restricted individual, restricted to himself. If all the preceding is to be accepted, it must therefore follow that Marx cannot be said to have any relevant link to the utilitarian tradition. It might be argued, however, that Marx seems to ground all his rebuttals on the idea that utilitarianism places the alienated notion of the individual as a private being at the core of its system, what can lead one to think that some form of utilitarianism within a communist society, where the prevailing individual is social, could be accepted by Marx. Whereas it might be true that a utilitarian doctrine of that kind would seem more acceptable in such circumstances, Marx would still object to it. The reason for this, as I have previously mentioned, lies on the fact that the principle of utility alone is nothing but an abstract and empty formalism which can only be given content by sources external to it. Under the material circumstances of a communist society, some form of utilitarianism might indeed manage to adequately represent ethical life. However, were that the case, it would certainly not be due to the principle itself, but to the improved material life of men, which the utilitarian doctrine alone cannot bring about.